If you, like me, have been paying attention to the tidal wave of AI news over the last few months, then it's easy to feel quite overwhelmed. We seem to be entering into a new age of AI, and it's not only unclear where it's all heading, it also feels like we are spectators, watching the future happen to us. Well, that is why I thought it would be interesting to review a book that I read last year called Resisting AI. Although Resisting AI was only published in 2022, less than a year ago, there is a sense that it's from a time that was before the dam burst, before DALI 2 and then ChatGPT flooded our timelines. But I think there are still some useful insights to be gleaned from the ideas that Dan McQuillan brings to our attention. Although, as I describe at the end of the video, there are also some aspects of it that I found less convincing. McQuillan starts his book by grounding the reader with a high-level view of how contemporary AIs actually work, explaining how architectures like deep learning can be thought of as sophisticated mathematical procedures that use large sets of data to optimise a complex function. One of the reasons for doing this is to demystify the apparent magical nature of AIs and show that under the hood, they are just complex maths processing lots of numbers. But this is also the beginning of a theme that runs through much of the book, highlighting the way that these AI tools can be seen as an extension of an existing long-term trend in our societies to quantify, categorise and then control the world through measurement and the application of statistics. Indeed, later on McQuillan makes the explicit link with the classic book Seeing Like a State which charts the history of state control through the centralised collection and processing of data that allowed states to manage their domains over longer distances. But anything that can't be quantified simply doesn't exist in the eyes of such a control mechanism, and nuance that people care about often gets lost in the rigid categorizations that the state deems necessary. McQuillan draws parallels to the blind spots that contemporary AI systems have for anything that can't be measured and corralled into a suitable training dataset. Another aspect of these systems that McQuillan wants us to keep forefront in our minds is the material and labour basis that underpin their operation. To us it may appear as simply a cool website, but behind the scenes are huge data centres consuming resources, and also a large workforce of precariously employed humans helping to mark up training data sets and give human feedback to help steer the training process. And of course, the billions of words of text and the vast databases of training images were also all the work of human creativity. So there is a huge amount of hidden human labour and material resource consumption that sits behind, say, ChatGPT being able to write an amusing poem. But McQuillan's goal of writing this book is not just to bring attention to the unfairness of a few large companies financially benefiting from all of the accumulated human creativity and work that goes into these systems. Rather, his main concern is the way that these AI systems, as currently constituted, are likely to extend and deepen the harm that our societies already inflict on the vulnerable and less represented members of our society. To illustrate the way that these existing systems are already causing algorithmic harm, McQuillan mentions a number of reports from 2019 as examples of how algorithmic systems for assessing welfare benefits can already be seen to unfairly discriminate against disadvantaged groups. In Sweden, thousands of people were wrongly classified as having made suspicious benefits claims when they'd done no such thing. In Spain, applications for electricity subsidies were being systematically discarded if they were submitted by poor households. In Austria, a system supporting job seekers was shown to discriminate against candidates on the basis of gender and disability. Of course, systems are going to make some mistakes, but when there is no human left to appeal to, how can these mistakes be spotted and rectified? The fear has got to be that politicians will seek to use sophisticated AIs to cut down the size of government further until our interface for accessing government services 
will be exclusively via chatbots. There simply won't be a human in the loop. And this may not even be done to save money. McQuillan points out that such moves towards automation are often just as much about removing the hassle of having to deal with a human workforce who may object to and disrupt changes that the politicians, or even the capitalist bosses, want to implement. And again, McQuillan notes that this is just another step in the long history of nation-states and capitalists using technology to undermine the bargaining power and agency of the working class. So, without going down the sci-fi-esque roots of people like Nick Bostrom, who worry about super-intelligent AIs taking over the world and destroying humanity, when Dan McQuillan says that we should resist AI, it is because he is more concerned about the immediate harms that are likely to happen, even with the existing levels of AI systems. Harms that aren't revolutionary new things, but are an escalation of existing patterns of oppression and control by the powerful. Although easy to read, McQuillan's book is thick with references to other people's work and their approaches to thinking about social concerns. Just as one example, he references Agamben's notion of bare life, life stripped of all its qualities and kept in a space where the law applies by not applying. The millions of refugees left for decades in refugee camps are the closest example of bare life, as they have been left abandoned in a state of mere existence without almost any legal rights. McQuillan notices that there is a less severe but still highly oppressive situation that can now happen even to people living in wealthy countries but who get excluded from large domains of contemporary society because some set of computers somewhere opaquely decided that they've crossed some kind of hidden threshold. And these algorithmic decisions often have the effective force of law, even though they are usually absent of any of the usual due processes that are necessary for the application of law to be just. And with so much of our political economy being run digitally, this isn't about being excluded from accessing some entertainment website or whatever. As we've seen in the examples I mentioned earlier, people can get into a state of exception where they're living a Kafkaesque kind of existence, being excluded from the job market or from welfare support or from healthcare for reasons that are never made clear to them. It's a pretty bleak picture that McQuillan paints. His fundamental suggestion, as given by the subtitle of his book, is that we need to develop what he calls an anti-fascist approach to AI. He doesn't mean that all AI is necessarily fascistic, but that the current approach being taken has powerful tendencies towards supporting the kind of totalizing, centralized control that all too easily could enable and entrench fascistic styles of politics. And he charts how, in many ways, this is a continuation of the darker side of the history of computing. Given the political trends around the world in the last decade or so, the idea that AI might facilitate and favour authoritarian, oppressive regimes ought to give us all serious cause for concern. While there are always details to quibble about, I think McQuillan's basic analysis of this risk is correct and important. What I was less convinced about were his suggestions for what we can actually do about it. Throughout the book, McQuillan references interesting strands of academic and political thought, like feminism and post-colonialism, and in particular standpoint theory, and seeks to learn from them and adopt their existing strategies for attempting to overcome systems of oppression. This leads McQuillan to suggest that we should be building what he calls a post-normal AI, by centering human values, mutual aid, and the principle of care rather than the ultra-rationalism and scientism that is all too present in the AI field today as it seeks to build a statistical view from nowhere. There's obviously a lot of detail that I'm skipping over here, but I mention these snippets to give a hint of the sort of academia for a general audience style of the book, a style that I personally enjoyed but others might find off-putting. And while there are details of McQuillan's thinking that I would quibble with. This review is too long already, so 
I'll just stick here with commenting on the bigger picture. One underlying theme that I certainly agree with is that there's an urgent need to update the philosophical plumbing of our mainstream culture, and I explore related issues in other videos. Towards the end of the book, McQuillan presents his most substantive suggestion for what we ought to be doing, and that is to use people's councils to organise an alternative approach to developing and using technologies like AI. He describes these people's councils as exemplars of collaborative deliberation, in which tools like AI could be developed as a common good within a solidarity economy. In theory, this all sounds great, but to be honest, I just don't understand how the practicalities of this proposal would work. Setting up people's councils in, say, the UK is neither going to slow down the activities of the giant actors like OpenAI and Google, nor is it going to stop millions of people in the UK who happen to live near those people's councils from adopting the tools from the giants, especially as, for now at least, those corporate-sponsored tools will be so much more useful than any AI tools that anyone else can afford to create. Powerful AI is here whether we like it or not. The question is what are the ways that it could change our societies, and what are the realistic routes for us to influence this future to be the best possible for humanity? Of course, there are plenty of individual choices that we can make about how to engage with the AI tools being laid in front of us, when to use them, when to avoid them, and indeed when to resist their imposition. But I think the only actors that are strong enough to impose meaningful restraints on the further development and use of AI tools are nation-states and intrastate bodies like the EU. But early on in the book, McQuillan seems to dismiss the idea that state regulation could be any meaningful help to mitigate the serious risks of AI. Here I have to disagree with McQuillan, both on the pragmatic grounds that we need to act with speed, but also because, well, I'm not an anarchist. Despite all the obvious downsides, I believe in the idea of democratic government, with a state that can act as we the people think is necessary. And right now, we urgently need our nation-states to start guiding the AI juggernaut into a socially responsible and beneficial direction. Our part in that is to have the public discussions that might influence policymakers with existing power. And indeed, a recent letter signed by thousands of researchers in the AI field is an example of this that, at the very least, publicly raised the suggestion of urgent government regulation. So my overall judgement of the book is that it's another classic example where the analysis of the problem is more convincing than the suggestions of what to do about it. But it's all interesting, and it's not a long book, so I'd encourage you to read Resisting AI. And we all need to keep talking together and developing a shared understanding of how these new, powerful technologies are going to transform our societies. So how do you think we should be engaging with AI? And if you've read Resisting AI, what did you think of McQuillan's proposals? Let's discuss your thoughts in the comments below. Being proactive about how we shape society is exactly what this channel is about. So if you enjoyed this video, then please do subscribe and join me as I continue to explore our unfolding future together. Thank you for watching.